Stephen, some scientists like to find one thing that is really the the uh, aspect of of the universe that engenders it all. Some look to the laws of physics. Some say it's mathematics. Others would would now say it's something about information that doesn't just represent reality, but is somehow is reality. How do you look at information in terms of what the cosmos is? Well, of course, information is kind of the the most prominent thing of our times. I mean, we, we live in a time when you explain things in terms of computers. In past ages, uh, clockwork was the, the thing of the times, and so <laughs> things were explained in terms of clockwork. But I think actually there's something more fundamental going on. I mean, to me, what's important if one is going to do theoretical science is that there be some definite rules that govern what happens in the universe. Now, there's a question of what kinds of rules are they? What, what kinds of things, what kinds of elements, what kinds of primitives do you use to build up those mm. rules? But the most important thing is that there are rules at all. And to me, computation is a convenient, broad way to capture a large class of rules. But the idea that these rules are running in computers as computer programs, that's really a just a, a, a sort of a current feature. I mean, it, it, uh, it's not something that's, that's fundamental to, to what's going on. What's fundamental is that there are definite rules and uh, that those rules can generate what we see in nature. Now, you can ask the question, how, what's the relationship between those rules and the reality of nature? So, you know, one of the things that's always interesting in doing natural science, one's interested in finding models of things. What is a model? It's something that, you know, captures certain essential features of a system and idealizes other stuff away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you'll have a model of some particular thing and you'll say, I'm going to capture uh, the, 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 this particular feature. I'm going to ignore the fact mm -hmm. that something else can happen. Okay. And so then there's a question of, of, uh, what is the relationship between the models and the reality? Now, you know, a popular model for the last 300 years in the physical sciences has been mathematical equations, particularly differential equations and so on. And one might have the view, as some, you know, some physicists particularly tend to think because that's been their methodology for so many years that that really is reality, mm. that reality is these differential equations. It's always kind of charming for me as, uh, mm. as I suppose, the producer of the, the main thing in the world that solves differential <laughs> equations for people as a piece of software mm -hmm. that I kind of imagine, you know, that people think that inside the earth there are lots of little Mathematica programs running <laughs> that are solving the differential equations that determine the motion of the earth. Of course, this is not how it really works. The, the model is not the reality. It's merely a description of the reality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, uh, when we talk about these simple rules that can be run in computers and so on, those again are descriptions of reality. What's always difficult about modeling is that somehow modeling is always a very controversial business because when, when you have a model, somebody may say, this model is great. It captures exactly what I need to know about and it idealizes away things I don't care about. This model, you know, succeeds in telling me everything I need to know to build this engineering device or whatever else. And somebody else may say, no, 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 your model is hopeless. You know, it doesn't capture this particular feature that I was really most interested in. So in a sense, it's, a, it's sort of a frustrating thing about modeling that there's always this kind of sure. uh, this battle of whether you captured what you really needed to capture. There's sort of only one case ultimately where things are really grounded and where you don't have that issue, which is if you try to find a model, an ultimate model for, for physics. Because then if there really is an ultimate single model of physics, then that model is not an idealization. That model just is a model for the universe. It is a description of everything that happens in the universe. And if we were to run that model long enough, that model would reproduce every detail of what happens in the universe, everything mm. up to what we're saying yeah. to each other right now and mm. so on. Um, that model wouldn't be our universe. It would merely be a representation of our universe. Um, and would it be one, one thing to understand is you might think, okay, if we have a model, then we've kind of cracked everything that will happen in the universe. We immediately know everything we need to know about the universe. Well, that's not really true because even though we may have the fundamental rules, even though we may have the fundamental model, we still have to run that model to find out what consequences it has. And one of the things that I've found is, is this thing I call computational irreducibility, which is something that kind of shows us that finding out the consequences of a model may require you to essentially go through as many steps as the model itself goes through. You may not be able to reduce the amount of computational work necessary to find out the consequences of this model. So you, you can, even though you may have the final ultimate model, 
and you may represent it in, certain, in terms of, let's say, computation, it's still the case that to build up the actual reality, you need to kind of follow through um, in a sort of irreducible way what the model implies. Contrast for me the, uh, the, the rules that have the computational irreducibility that, that generate the universe with another view of computation that would have the, uh, almost a digital approach to the comp computation in the universe where every particle has, is sort of like a, its own little uh, a digital computer and, and the universe is sort of self-computing itself. So it's a different view of information. Uh, in terms of the universe, but the, the, the sounds similar, but they're really f some fundamental differences. Well, I think you know, there, there's, a, there's a level, of if, if you believe that things work by you know, clockwork and you've seen a clock and you imagine that inside uh, each, uh, I don't know, atom or something, there's yeah. actually a clock sitting yeah, there right. because you've seen a clock, right. right? So similarly, people have seen sort of computer programs as they operate in practice and, you know, uh, a practical computer and they say, well, this looks something vaguely like the universe. Let's put one of those practical computer programs straight into our electron. <laughs> okay. Uh, it might work. I think it's kind of naive mm. because I think that if there really is a simple model of the universe, we don't get to, we don't have sort of the luxury of taking these things that we already know about, that we're already familiar with. That if there really is a simple model for the universe, you have to kind of, to, to compress things to the point where there can be that simple a model, it's sort of inevitable that you have to get underneath all the concepts that we now know. Mm -hmm. We won't have recognizable things that are like kind of the traditional digital computer mm -hmm. gadgets that, mm -hmm. we're, that we're used to dealing mm -hmm. with. Um, and so, so I think that the, the, the kind of, the, the, the way that I'm, uh, you know, my own guess is that it's um, that if we're going to have, uh, I think there is an ultimate representation of the universe that is in terms of simple rules, um, but those rules, they're best thought about, they're best conceptualized in terms of computation, but it isn't the case that each electron is running an object-oriented <laughs> program that interacts with this other thing. It's something where it is a critical metaphor Without that metaphor, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder in terms of the science that I've, that I've tried to develop and so on, could this have been developed at another time in history? And certainly a lot of the ideas of, of following simple rules and so on, you know, the Babylonians were following simple rules, different kinds of simple rules. Could they have developed this, this science? I think some aspects of it they could. But one thing that's really missing is that to really make progress with this, you have to have a kind of intuition that comes from our widespread exposure to computation. And it's only been in, in very recent years that this book kind of we've, we've uh, absorbed enough of kind of the, the general intuition of computation, whether it's an idea like, you know, programs that you write may have bugs. There may be, you know, it may be, it may be difficult to foresee what a program will do. Or, you know, you can take something which seems like a digital representation of things and, uh, uh, you know, create something that looks like a perfect image that's just like what we see. These kinds of things are now absolutely familiar to us. But in the past, they would have seemed uh, things that we wouldn't even guess would be possible. So I think that the, the idea that, you know, computation is, uh, computation is a, is a kind of a, a, a conceptual framework that is sort of critical I think, to making progress and understanding how the universe works. But we shouldn't imagine that the actual way the universe works is by the operation of sort of recognizable programs kind of running in each little particle of the universe.